Ian Paisley, you are the son of former DUP leader from 1971 to 2008, Ian Paisley. What is it like growing up with a dad who was a political giant? Yeah, um, w when you reflect on it, it was crazy. But for me, my dad was just a normal, really loving, kind dad. I have a twin brother, three older sisters, and dad was the life and soul of our house. And he looked after us really well. And that was the kind of dad I grew up with. Um, he wasn't always there. He was in jail a few times. He was not always there to take us to school. But when he was there, he was very compassionate and very caring and uh, taught me an awful lot about life and gave those life lessons all the time. But uh, on the other side of it, what people saw was this larger than life, charismatic, political and religious figure who dominated Irish and British politics for near on 35, 40 years. And uh, I think some people went, God help us kids. And others went, wow, aren't they incredibly fortunate? And for me, who love politics, to be in that environment, to almost have a, a ringside seat at a heavyweight boxing championship and see how all the moves are pulled was a real um, blessing and a real opportunity. You said that he gave you lots of life lessons. Is there one in particular that you attribute to him? Uh, two. First of all, my dad always said, remember son, it's not a dress rehearsal. Every single day is for real. Live it for real every single day. You, know, you can't come back and relive yesterday. So make sure you live it absolutely. Dress rehearsal, no regrets every single day the way you should. And the other thing, he was always fascinated with time. And then he put a massive clock on the front of his church with the words, time is short. And he said to me, remember, time is short. That's only how you use your time that will really matter. The only thing I own, the only thing I possess is my time. Everything else is fleeting. So use it wisely. And indeed, to that, I carry one of his watches every day with me. All the time, I always carry one of his pocket watches, which um, reminds me of that. When I'm in Parliament or I'm doing something, I always look at and remember, time's short. Live it. Live it true. It's very moving. Thank you for sharing that. So I guess when you have such a leading political figure as a dad, you can go one of two ways. You can rebel and think, I want nothing to do with that. You didn't. You chose to follow in his footsteps. Was that always a, a certainty for you? Did you always know I am following in his footsteps? Yeah, I, I always kind of had the thing of, yes, I'm, I'm following doing what, what my dad did. But my dad was first and foremost a pastor. You know, that's how, if you ask me, what, what, who was your dad? My dad was a minister. Um, the fact that he did politics was just something that was kind of everyone else saw. Um, so my, my twin brother went into the ministry. Um, I uh, we used to joke, uh, you take the church, I'll take the party. You know? <laughs> so, uh, we, uh, I did follow him in, though. It wasn't really what he would have wanted me to do. I think that dad would very much probably like both his sons to be in the ministry. Um, uh, but th that wasn't for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I followed him into that. Uh, you know, in politics, Gloria, I mean, name recognition is exceedingly important. And I had that built in, not only as a surname, but also as my first name, a Christian name. And uh, so I had that benefit. But as you know, you have to want to do this job. Um, he certainly didn't corral me into it. He tried to encourage me to look at other things. Um, but I had the bug, I had the disease. I wanted to do it. And I really love doing it. I really love politics. And I think I have something to contribute. I think I can articulate a case for the people who sent me to Parliament and previously sent me to the Northern Ireland Assembly. And I think that people need strong advocates, dedicated advocates, and people who will work for them. And I, I picked up that lesson from him that, you know, it's about all the service you put in that ultimately provides in hard times for those people and then for you. And uh, I really enjoy that service part of politics. You, you have strong Christian beliefs too, despite not going into the ministry. Yeah. Um, the lay members of the church are far more important, you know. <laughs> um, do, does your, your faith ever conflict with politics or put pressure on politics or cause difficulties in politics? I, I think people will always want to see that and always say, oh, we say not because he's a Christian or because he's got those particular views. I think we have to get to a society where it becomes easy to say difficult things to each other, but with respect. You know, and at the moment we have a society where it's 
quite difficult to say difficult things because people either on social media take it up wrong or they twist it or turn it or try to portray you as a hate figure or in a particular stereotypical way. And I think we have to get to the point where we can say, and, and Christianity and some of the views that Christians hold can be difficult. And I think we have to get to the point where we are able to say those difficult things respectfully and understand them to each other. But yes, of course, there's conflicts. And it's about balancing that conflict. You know, Christ said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God. Um, so there is a, a way of dividing it and doing it right. But God is ultimately king of the kingdom that I'm in. And I have to ultimately bow to him and to his sovereignty and to no one else's. Um, I had a constituent in my office last Friday and they brought their, 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 their kid in with them. They picked them up from school and we were chatting about their things and I have a lovely portrait on the wall when I got the honour of meeting Her Majesty the Queen. And the guy said, look at that to his daughter, there's a there's a picture of, of Mr Paisley with the Queen. And I was very impressed and I took it off and I showed the kid the picture. And, uh, and then her father said, but you know, you can meet the King of Kings and I think Mr Paisley knows the King of Kings as well. And I think that's, you know, it's a, it's a beautiful lesson that actually, you know, Whilst we honour people here on earth, we have a greater purpose and it's a purpose for our souls and for other people's souls and we should never lose sight of that. Going back to, I noticed that you worked for your dad for a bit after you left university. That can't be easy, can it? No. <laughs> very demanding. Very demanding. I mean, my dad would uh, do six people's work in one day. You know, he was a very, very hard worker. He had that kind of work ethic about him. And he could achieve so much. I mean, he published something like 40, 50 books in his life. He edited a magazine every month. He edited a local newspaper. He was a minister of religion. He was constantly on the go, but he got things done. And he didn't leave things undone. And I think that was a great example to see a boss like that. And he expected me to pull my weight and to earn my crust and probably to do slightly more than everyone else to show that I wasn't there because of favor, that I was there to, to earn my keep. And I think that's, again, a very positive lesson that, uh, uh, you know, because people will always say, oh, you're only there because of your father or your mother. But if you can show that you've got value, can add value and are a hard worker and put the hours in, I think people see that and see that you're actually are committed to the issue. And just because you've had the privilege of who your parents happen to be mm -hmm. doesn't mean to say you can throw that uh, or that can be thrown to the side. Um, but yes, he, he was a, a very demanding boss. Um, I loved working for him. I mean, it was a buzz every single day. I got to meet some fascinating people, to set up some fascinating meetings. Remember in 2006, we were in the United States of America. We'd heard that Donald Trump was interested in investing in Northern Ireland. And we knew that he wanted to invest in the North Antrim coast, which is my father's, was then my father's constituency. So he said to me, get me a meeting with him. I went, right, okay. <laughs> So we literally phoned people till we got a number. I got a meeting set up with them and we went in and had the meeting with Donald Trump to see would he invest in Northern Ireland. Unfortunately, invested in Aberdeenshire, but <laughs> we got in, we got around the table, we talked. Um, we actually created a, a relationship there. And life is about relationships and that relationship has lasted and was a very beneficial and helpful relationship, even though we didn't invest in that occasion. Do you know, just listening to you, because very few people have what you have, like, you know, political giants as their, as their dads. I just wonder, oh, do you always, are, are you left wondering or thinking, I can never be as great as my dad? No, because he wasn't like that. My dad was, in, even though he was robustious and, and outspoken, he was incredibly humble. And he didn't, whilst he was self-aware, and self-awareness is very important. He he never had the view of, there's the mark, you make it. His view was, you do it your own way. Be yourself. Imitations, clones don't work. If I was a clone of my dad, I, everyone would see through me. Uh, if I was trying to imitate him, and I've seen people trying to imitate him in their political careers, it doesn't work. But I can learn from him. And I think the life lessons learned and applied your way are the best way to sh show flattery to someone but also to respect the lessons that they've given you. Let's just finally talk about today's politics. Your, your natural political allies in Westminster is the Conservative and Unionist Party. Mm. So they say, Gloria. But we've always had a better deal from Labour. 
any time we've had a Labour Prime Minister or a Labour Secretary of State they've understood Northern Ireland usually better. Their bark has been uh, worse than their bite, you might say. Whereas we've always kind of had the fear, will Labour take us in a particular direction, mm. closer to United mm. Ireland? But their bark about that and their actual bite has been very, very different. Um, yes, the Conservatives call themselves the Conservative and Unions Party, but I believe that the Conservative Party today is becoming more and more a English Nationalist Party that doesn't really understand what's going on in Scotland, certainly in Northern Ireland and in other regions. And we've got to, and I've got to try and encourage them and educate them and help them to understand. Yeah, Northern Ireland's two, three percent of the whole of the UK, but this is what we really believe. And we're not little Englanders trying to be little Englanders. We're proud Northern Ireland people who have an identity of our own and you've got to understand it and govern on that basis. Is the door always open for you? I assume that whenever you want uh, an audience at number 10 with the Prime Minister, you, you can get one, right? I usually can, yeah. <laughs> So, but so, 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 how can you persuade him of the merits of your arguments? Yeah, well, well, the current prime minister, uh, as you know, and I, I mean, Boris Johnson has extremely important skills and very, very helpful skills. Despite all of the criticisms he has, he has pulled in so many other directions and pulling him in and getting him and giving him a one liner or two lines on the Northern Ireland situation that he then can grasp and understand and take forward. That's always key. Uh, it's not always easy um, because he's, as I say, he's pulled in so many different directions that it's not always possible to get that attention span on the Northern Ireland situation. And I have enough self-awareness to know that Northern Ireland is not taking up his attention. You know, so many other things are. So we've got to do things to draw his attention before things go bad again in Northern Ireland. And I would far rather he gets it now than reacts to a situation. You trust him to ultimately resolve the Northern Ireland protocol? I don't trust anyone in politics. I've become really sceptical, you know, and I think that it's foolish to put your trust in, 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 in people. Uh, we can only trust the people that they will, um, you know, hopefully elect sensible people, and then that we can trust those people to respond positively to the messages and the political policies that we have. But the idea that I'm trusting this particular politician, I think those days have long since gone. Brilliant to listen to you. Thank really you. fascinating. Thank you for your time. Thank you.